Proverbs chapter 17, and I will read various verses from this chapter. Proverbs 17. Give you a moment to find that. Psalms is usually in the middle of your Bible, close to there, and then we have Proverbs. I want you to follow along. There's so much wisdom from this chapter, and I'll have it on the screen if you don't have your Bible. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Skip me to verse 14. Starting a quarrel is like breaching the dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. One whose heart is corrupt does not prosper. One whose tongue is perverse falls into trouble. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. And whoever has understanding is even tempered. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for families. Thank you for the families in this church, the families that that we're a part of. Lord, every single person here is a part of a family of mothers and brothers and sisters and parents and perhaps children, God. And Father, you love the family. You died for the family. Family is your idea, God. You are our Father. Jesus is our brother. But Lord, the reality is that if we look at our families, God, that, that there's no perfect family. Everybody has challenges. Every family has struggles. Every family has hurts. Lord, I, I would imagine, God, that there's, if you look far enough in our families, either to our parents or our brothers or sisters or children, that, Father, there's probably a lot of hurt and pain when it comes to our families, Lord. There's a lot of brokenness. There's healing that needs to take place. There's wisdom, God. I just pray, Lord, you would speak wisdom into the families that are here this morning, whether that's one person or multiple people, Lord. God, help us have a vision for families that you have created, Lord, because it seems like they're just bar barely hanging in there in our culture today. So many families are falling apart, God. And Lord, as we see in Proverbs today, much of the destruction and devastation comes from words. Words that are spoken, Lord, that reflect hearts. God, may each person see this morning that our words can either bless our families or our words can curse our families for generations, God. Your word, Father, tells us that our words are very powerful, Father. So be with us now. Grant us great wisdom and discernment and a heart this morning to change, to transform the ways that we speak to one another so that we can transform our families for your glory, God. Do that through the power of your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so we're starting this morning this new series of fantastic families. And uh, that's that's like what everybody wants. Okay, I want to have a great family. I want to have a you know family we just love each other, that you know we protect each other, that we care for one another, that we say kind words to one another. And uh, we're going to look at those words, but I wanted to just think that, you know, words are so powerful. What we say, just nonchalantly, to our family members, can carry so much force. Whether we're kidding, 
whether we're sarcastic, whether we're encouraging, whether we're tearing down, words create images from family. And those images then can become realities. I got a kick out of this video, and thank you, Carrie. Carrie finds some great videos. Thank you for, for doing that. But, you know, you all can laugh because we all can relate to that, right? If you've ever come bring in the family to church, you can relate to this, this video. And, and I think it's kind of funny because, you know, we know what takes place. There just can be, it's not always just a loving, beautiful, I love you on the way to church. Okay? Sometimes it's the opposite of that. And parents, you know, I know parents will get out of their car, and, and when it's time to walk into church, all, right, all the healthy parenting skills just go out the window. All right? It's like, if you just stop bugging your brother, I will let you have ice cream all day long. If you will stop teasing your sister, you can have free video time for a week. You don't have to clean your room, right? Okay, all those things we know <laughs> they, 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 they're supposed to be, well, you're not supposed to ride the kids, right? Now, all those go, it's just like, hey, please behave. We're going into the house of the Lord. Will you please stop that? Now, my, my dad, and when, when my brother and I were younger, he had a different approach, okay? Um, he did not bribe us with good things. He threatened us, right? So, you know, we, we'd be going to church, and my, my brother's three years older than me, you know, and, you know, my dad would draw the line in the car seat, at the back of the seat, right? And he'd say, all right, don't cross that line, that's your side. And, and of course, as soon as he's driving, a hand comes across, or a poke comes across, or a pinch comes across, right? And so I remember, you know, my dad would just say, look, you know, you are going to get a spanking in church if you guys don't stop this. I want you to behave. And then we get into church, and of course, you know, as soon as we get in the pew, we're, we're younger now, and we just start bugging each other. We'd say something, we'd poke or something like that, and it seemed like every Sunday we were taken outside and we were spanked by our father. Now, I love my father. I don't. I deserve every spanking I got, okay? But that was just this different approach. And Proverbs says, and I, and I could have talked on this, spare the rod, spoil the child. Oh, you've heard that before. Spare the rod. There, hey, there's one passage that says, beat that child with a rod. She'll live. <laughs> you can't even breathe that today. They'll be like, you know, you will be arrested just for thinking that. So, you know, times change. So, but, but, but it's a principle in Proverbs that, that uh, discipline, discipline's important. That's what it's saying. It's not literally saying you need to grab a rod, although, you know, a switch or, a, you know, things like that. When, when I was younger, not anymore. All right, in our family, I think we spanked each of our children one time. All right? Zach got one. Now, other families are different, right? And I, and I understand that. You know, I was talking with somebody from church last week, and they said, oh, yeah, no, that we bring out the hammer. I'm like, what are you going to get? Yeah, they know what that, that they're going to get spanking or they're going to get a whooping. And, and so look, I, I'm not saying right or wrong with that, but, but let me give you a little warning when it comes to discipline. And we will talk about words, but um, I remember I was angry with Jessica one time when she was real young. And I was just angry because she was, you know, she wasn't listening. And so I reached out and, and I took her by the arm, you know, to, to correct her. And I squeezed tight because I was angry, all right? And at that point, I got nervous. And I realized, you know what? I, I can't physically engage to correct Jessica because I get angry. And I just drew a line there that I'm never going to physically, you know. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. What I'm saying is you got to know your limits. And when we look at Proverbs, we're talking about boundaries. We're talking about everybody, everybody knowing their own limits. And so... You know, there's a lot of verses that talk about discipline. Discipline is key. But, but as you talk about words, if we have wisdom from God's word all right, on the words we choose in our family, you're going to see this morning, things can be diffused before they ever get out of control. Okay? And you know what I mean by that. And so we have to pray for discernment. We have to pray for wisdom. We have to be into God's word because he's going to tell us, you know, how to handle situations. We'll look at some of those, just a few of those passages this morning. But I encourage you, keep just read all of Proverbs 17 and look at the passages that are around uh, this one chapter that, that, that we look at. So families are not always as they appear. And when I say the power of words... 
we're obviously not just talking about the words themselves, but the action, the heart behind those words. Because you can say the right words in your family, and it can be seen very quickly that the heart's in the wrong place. Have you ever had that take place? Right? You say the right thing. It's the right thing to say, but things just go south because it's clear your heart was not into it. And Jesus said the heart is very important behind the words that we choose, the words that we use uh, with our families. So, the power of words. If you, as you look back and you just think, all right, we're talking about the power of words of parents to their children, of brothers to their sisters, sisters to uh, children to their parents. Hey, you know, the children that are in here that didn't go to class, um, you, you don't understand the power, I don't think, of your words that you can use towards your parents to bless your parents. I mean, kids, when you actually say things and mean things like, you know, you're a great mom. When's the last time you told your mom, thank you for being a great mom? And don't wait till Mother's Day, right? Is that the only time we would use words as children, teenagers, young adults to bless your parents? Okay, because they are so powerful. Word, the words, I love you, or I'm proud of you. In fact, in, um, in, in this chapter that we're looking at, Proverbs 17, it says that parents are the pride of their children. Oh my goodness. That's opposite so much to our culture today. It's like, get away from me, you know. You're, you're, you're rubbing off that cool vibe as mom, with mom and dad, right? You go through that stage where, you know, the, the, you don't want to be around mom and dad. But the Bible says, look, that's in this family when parents are, kids are proud of their parents. And you let your parents know that. That is so powerful. That can change a relationship. It can change, words can change the course of a relationship. You know, I, I know, I don't know about you, but, you know, I could be in the car with my family and we could be going somewhere and uh, we could be going to this fun activity. Maybe we're going to go out to dinner, we're going to go meet some people to, you know, have an evening together. And, and I can just say one thing and it will derail the entire evening. You know what I'm talking about? You say one, one sentence the wrong way and it can be so hurtful, right? And then it just kind of spirals. It goes down downhill from there. So you can think of instances as you look at your marriage, as you look at when you were a child, were there any words that were common words that were used about you that were not a blessing, that were a curse? It could be different for all of us. Maybe you never had those words. I pray you didn't, but more often than not, words like, you are so clumsy. You're so clumsy. You are just, you know, it's not that you're acting stupid, it's, man, you are so stupid. Can't you be more like your sister? Can't you be more like your brother? Oh, those words are so destructive. So hurtful. I want to just challenge you at the start, before we even go through this text, to change the words that you are using with your spouse and with your children and with your parents. And God's word says that you can transform your family. You can transform your household if you are careful and loving with your words. Don't be cutting down. Don't be sarcastic. And you know, I hear people say all the time, I'm just kidding. You know what? Kidding hurts. That's what I have found out over the years. It is never appropriate to use sarcasm with your family because sarcasm in and of itself says that there's a little truth there. And that hurts. And everybody laughs and everybody giggles, but it's a zinger. You know, does your family have little zingers? You know, little things that you say, it's just like this little push, okay? That's not appropriate. That is not healthy, especially for kids, because it sounds funny, but then they grow up with this. So let's, let's look, let's dig into this text here as we think about the power of words. And here's, here's what God says in, in, in Proverbs 17, verse one. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. 
That's verse 1 of Proverbs 17. And that's pretty obvious what that's saying, right? It's better to have a stale piece of bread and to eat that uh, than to have fighting and strife in the home. Okay, you can have this beautiful meal that's all laid out. And how many beautiful meals have been ruined by words that are said at the dinner table? See? So, and, and think about, do, do you ever feel like, can we just have a little peace and quiet in our home? Right? Do ever things in the family just seem so chaotic, so full of strife and tension and just constantly there, right? It's just like, wow, can we just, you know, have some quiet in this place? That would be, but I'd rather eat bad toast and have that. Think y'all, can, can we all relate to that? Now skip down to verse 14. It says, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Oh, that is so wise. And you get the imagery there. Okay. You know, it's just one word can, like, breach the dam. And then water just starts to flow out. Because what happens is one negative word, one critical word, all right, leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to a sentence, which leads to a paragraph. And you just can see pretty, pretty soon your house, your home, your family just overflowing. Your marriage with kind of this negative conversation and you're fighting, you know, back and forth. So it says, it says here, um, you know, don't start that quarrel. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. That is just such wise advice because things can rapidly, rapidly escalate. Things can be so hurtful. Now, we're coming up on the holidays very quickly. I know that's a gasp, right? Okay, next Sunday's October 1st. And then, so, and you think about families and you think about the holidays, all right? And the hurtful things that, and you know, the holidays can be very tough for families, can't they? Even when you get together, it can be tough. But I know that there's families here that don't even want to see their family on the holiday. In fact, there are some people here this morning that have so much pain that there's been so much just repetitive, hurtful things that have been said and done in the family that they haven't talked to their family in 10, 20, 30 years. And that's the power of words. That's the devastation. So God's saying, look, you've got to be careful. You gotta know when to drop things. When to just let things go. Now you say, oh, that's opposite of what you said the last couple of weeks, because you said iron sharpens iron. You know, we need to be able to correct one another in love. Yes. So how do you know the difference when to drop something or when to correct someone? Because here it says drop, when to correct wisdom. Applied wisdom is the difference. And that's why we need discernment from God. We need to be in prayer. We need to seek godly wisdom in, in our families. And then you, then you will know. So, um, verse 19 says this, Whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. Okay, again, when I think about you know, siblings, does it ever seem like our siblings just like to get on each other's nerves? I don't know. I mean, it just seemed like that we're looking for a fight in families. And hopefully in the marriage you're not looking for a fight, right? But sometimes those brothers and those sisters, and if you've ever been a brother or sister or had a brother or sister, it's almost like we're looking for a fight. Why is that in families? Why would a brother or sister want to fight and bother each other? Why would that happen in a home? Because it happens a lot. And you know what? It goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. It is jealousy in the family. It's jealousy that causes that. And so God's saying, look, let's not quarrel. Let's, how can we build one another up? How can we truly care for one another? Let's not love to quarrel. And I know parents are thinking, oh, can we just, you know, if you knew my kids, it just seemed like, oh, my goodness. It's always like they're fighting. 
Okay, so we need to speak love and wisdom and help them to grow up. And that family is that environment where they learn to grow up and to love and care for one another. That's why the family is so important. And if you're not part of a family, that's why the family of God is so important. Because it's in this context, God's family, that we care for one another's children as well. And we model what it is to be loving. That's why a family on their own that's not plugged into the church, it's really difficult. Now, not all families and church discipline the same way. This is something I have found out. So I think you need to tread lightly here. But if it comes from a place of love, it comes from a place of care, then, then this family can just be a great um, environment, kind of like this, this uh, miniature world where we truly care and love for one another and then we are more prepared to go out into the world because we've got that training and care and love from one another. Are there other, you know what, I had somebody, and, I, and I'm not going to say who, but somebody came up to me a couple weeks ago and they said, hey, you know, we don't like to talk about this, but if, if anything were to happen to us, would you commit to raising an, uh, our daughter and being there, you know, for her, or, or at least to helping to distribute, you know, things and care for them in the transition? If we were, in, God forbid, in a plane wreck, you know, or, or a car crash. And boy, as we'll talk about in a minute, it can happen so quickly. But I said, man, I would love to because what better place than the church than right here to care for one another's kids? So, yes, we're talking about the individual family and how important that is. But we're talking about modeling and mentoring each other in the family of God. I think that our young adults, some of our young adults, are planning something. I hope it's not a surprise because I just blew it. But I think they're trying to get together with some of the some of the elderly folks in the congregation, right? Right, Grant? That, that's not a surprise, right? Okay, good. So that's isn't that awesome? Because you know what? Hey, our young adults have so much to offer. They are brilliant. They are hardworking. They are in love with Jesus Christ. And they are going to bless our elderly couples. If you want to get in on this, talk to Brendan. And then what wisdom we can gain from the elderly you know, couples that have walked with Jesus Christ for many, many years. See, that's how we bless each other. That's how we, that's the family of God being the family of God. And it's powerful, those, the words that we speak to one another. Now, I think I've got some pictures, if Michael got them in there, of, of some gates. I went up to Palace Verdes, and uh, I just took some pictures of some gates. Because listen to what it says. It says, uh, whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. Let's look at the, do we have a couple more there? Just, I want you to, now that's my favorite picture I took there. But imagine the gates, all right? Now, in the context of Proverbs, when it talks about building a high gate, sort of like it is now, that when you had a high gate, it was a sign of status. It was a sign of wealth. It was a sign of prestige. The gate represented something. So if you built the high gate, then people would look at your home and they would think you have your act together. Oh, that family, wow, they, man, look at that gate. Okay, they've got that high gate. And behind a high gate is a high house. It's a beautiful house. And you drive by and you can't go in. You can't go in because the gates are shut. The gates are locked. So you slow down and you look at that house and think, wow, I wish I was like that. Or I wish I had that money. Okay, but you don't know what's going on behind those gates. You don't know what's going on in that home. And I'm not judging people because they're wealthy or, or they're poor. We shouldn't judge people. But I just know that we can put up a good facade, can't we? We put up a good facade about our families. And then we come to church like that video and everything's fine. Okay, but God doesn't care about the gate. God doesn't care about the exterior. What God cares about is the heart. Where's the heart of the family? And I would say that the words, Jesus says this actually, the words that are being said in the family are a reflection of a person's heart. That's what Jesus said. So you think, well, I just fly off the cuff. When you fly off the cuff, you are reflecting your heart more than when you are thinking about it. Because when you're thinking about it, you can filter what you said with your family. 
when you slow down enough, and I, when you count to five or ten or whatever you have to count to, and you, then you're thinking about it, there's a filter there. And hopefully you say the right things. But flying off the cuff when you're angry or not or snapping at the kids. How many times do you snap at the children? Do you know that's a reflection of your heart, of what's going on inside? And so God says, watch that. Be careful of that. God cares not about the gate. He cares about the door to your heart. Amen? That's the truth. And in our families, that's God wants us to really be careful with these words. So let's, let's look here. Verse 27. The one who has knowledge uses words with what? Restraint. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. Whoever has understanding is even tempered. So I say two things that need to happen in our families. We need to have restraint with the words we use and we need to be slow to anger. We need to be even tempered because it can be so devastating. Verse 28, I love this, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongue. You heard that phrase, a man of few words? Uh, you know, that, that, that seems to reflect wisdom, right? It, this What is it that open your mouth, you know, one thing to be thoughtful and then open your mouth and remove all doubt, right? You know that, okay? Well, how does this apply in the family? Hey, look, he's saying it over and over again. He's speaking wisdom to you this morning that you need to leave church today and be resolved. Be resolved to change the way that you're speaking to your family. Even as family that lives far away, how do you speak to them on the phone? How do you speak to your children? Because listen to the necklace, pierce like swords. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. What is that saying? What's that saying about our words? Words hurt. You've been hurt. Everybody's been hurt by words that have been spoken in your family. And they are like a sword. They cut deep. They change. They shape in hurtful words towards, towards negative images of ourselves. And so, you know, moms, dads, got to be careful. So, words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings what? Healing. So, word, here's the choice. Here's the challenge. You can hurt with your words, or you can heal with your words. And every time you open your mouth, you are doing one or the other. That's the bottom line. You are hurting, or you are bring, bringing healing. Isn't this just wisdom that we need? I mean, just write these passages down and think about them because this words is so much where it starts. Let's look at this next passage. This is Proverbs 18, verse 21. Wow, I love this one. The tongue has the power of life and death. Let me say that again. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Have you ever heard the term, oh, he's going to eat his words? Yeah. All right? She's going to eat her words on that. That's what it's saying. That's what this, that's from the Bible. That's what this problem tells us. So, but life and death, in other words, the words we choose set the course of your life. They set the course of your marriage. They set, words set the trajectory of your family. God is trying just to give us, speak wisdom into our families this morning about the words that we choose. And then Proverbs 21, this is the last one for now. Proverbs 21, verse 23. Those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from what calamity? When you guard your words and you guard your tongue, you keep your family. How do you protect your family? God's trying to tell you. How do you protect relationships? How do you protect your marriage? How do you protect friendships, parents, and children? 
you guard your words because they lead, if you don't, they will lead towards calamity. What is calamity? That's that things fall apart. So we want to know why our family's falling apart. Why is my marriage falling apart? Why are my kids, you know, this way or that way? Why is everything so chaotic? Because of the words that we are choosing to either bless our families or curse our families. God says they have that much power. So think about this. I love you. I love you. Will you marry me? I'm pregnant. I hate you. You're pathetic. You're ugly. You're clumsy. I'm ashamed to say we used to have this game. I think I'm ashamed to say I was pretty good at it. <laughs> but it would be a put-down contest. And teenagers engage in this. And I remember vividly being on the bus, you know, coming to a football game or coming home from a football game, 